In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. When preparing for today's homily, as I read various articles and essays on the first reading appointed for today from Isaiah 6, one author wrote how preachers seem to gravitate to Isaiah 6 on Trinity Sunday, given its profound and awesome description of worship and a divine call from God to ministry. I smiled reading that. I was already planning on preaching in that text anyways. <laughs> Particularly because when I was ordained to the transitional diaconate in Abilene, Texas, on April 20th, 2008, 16 years ago, the choir master at my home parish asked me what anthem I might want the choir to sing. I'd been a paid singer in the choir, and singing in that choir was a big part of what drew me in to the Episcopal Church, where I found a church I did not know before existed. Immediately, I knew my answer to the question, and I asked Conrad if the choir might sing David McKinley Williams' setting of In the Year That King Uzziah Died. If you have not heard it, write down on your bulletin, David McKinley Williams, in the year King Uzziah died. Look it up on YouTube when you get home. You will not regret it. Now, depending on the pacing of the choir and choir master, it's a solid seven to eight minute anthem. Uh, but the kind choir master agreed. And after being ordained a deacon in Christ's church, I had the joy of listening to the choir sing that anthem while I set the altar for the very first time is an ordained person. And the anthem ends softly, the choir singing Isaiah's words for today, here I am, send me. Isaiah 6 is a dramatic and powerful, powerful vision that, that we're given, telling the story of Isaiah's own sense of calling to prophetic ministry. Even though Isaiah's writings are some of the most essential in the Hebrew Bible, we actually don't know much about the prophet himself. Other prophets, we know where they come from, what their jobs were, but Isaiah is a mystery to the text. The only thing scholars can agree on is that it seems he was somehow connected to the monarchy, perhaps a royal advisor or even a member of the royal family, given how easily he comes in and out of the throne room of the king of Judah. And so, in our reading for today from Isaiah 6, Isaiah is at worship in the temple. He likely would have been standing with the king by the column at the entrance to the temple. Scholars think it was probably an important feast day in the Jewish religion, perhaps Yom Kippur, the day of atonement when the priest makes sacrifice for the sins of the people. And Isaiah is surrounded by the smoke of the incense, the burning sacrifices, the noise from the festive throng of worshipers who have traveled to Jerusalem on this high holy day. All of a sudden, though, his experience of worship becomes a window into the heavenly court. He looks where the Ark of the Covenant would have been hidden in the Holy of Holies, and he sees God himself seated on a throne with his robe pouring out and filling the temple, darting in and through the smoke. He sees seraphim flying above God. Now, put away your image of flying handsome men that you've got in these windows here. That's not a seraphim. The word seraph means burning. It's a word used in Hebrew usually to describe a serpent. So these are fiery flying serpents. We have a different word for that right in English. Dragons. <laughs> the dragons are flying around singing the words we sing every Sunday at Mass in the Sanctus. Holy, 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 holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The glory of God is so profound that even the flying angelic dragons are covering their faces as they sing. Isaiah sees all of this and is quite simply undone. 
He's undone by a sense of his own sin, of, of the sin of his people. He's sure that this vision of God will destroy him until one of the seraphs takes a coal from the altar with a pair of tongs and touches Isaiah's mouth with it, telling Isaiah that this has purified him of his guilt and sin. And then the voice of God thunders forth from the throne asking, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah responds, here I am. Send. And while this is a, a beautiful and dramatic example of a prophetic call narrative, when you pull back and look at the rest of Isaiah, you will see the great and terrible import of this story. We're told, for example, that this takes place in the year that King Uzziah died. Uzziah had been king of Judah for over 50 years, and his reign had brought that small kingdom economic prosperity, military might, and greater influence in the political world of the ancient Near East. But this success clouded Uzziah's judgment. And he attempted to usurp the priesthood, entering the temple to burn incense on the high altar himself. The high priest and a band of 80 priests stopped Uzziah, telling him, no, don't do it, this is wrong. An earthquake then shook the ground, breaking a hole in the ceiling of the temple. And as the sun struck Uzziah's face, he was seized with leprosy. Made unclean, he was driven from the temple, lived the rest of his life in seclusion as his son Jotham took the throne in his place. So, in the year when Uzziah died, when Isaiah, a member of the royal court, is standing at the entrance of the temple, likely with Uzziah's son Jotham, and the priests are offering sacrifice of incense on the altar, something Uzziah tried to do, and all of a sudden, another earthquake strikes, and the doors of the temple shake, and he has this vision of God himself on the throne. I'm not surprised that he's scared. <laughs> it makes sense why Isaiah would be afraid that a similar fate is about to befall him, as fell upon Uzziah. And Isaiah's confession of his sin, of the sins of his people, is deeply authentic. Given the way the monarchy ended with Uzziah and what will take place in the following years with the next several kings to whom Isaiah will preach as prophet. The Assyrian Empire at this time was growing, slowly conquering and eating up the nations around it. The people of Judah were anxious. And so only 15 years into Jotham's reign, they push him into retirement so that his son Ahaz can take the throne. And when the kings of Israel in Syria try to get Ahaz to form an alliance with them, to create a buffer, to stop the Assyrian advance, Ahaz refuses. And instead, Ahaz makes an unholy alliance with the Assyrian Empire. The cost of that alliance is the destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel, ten tribes of God's chosen people, whew, gone. And Judah becomes a vassal state of the Assyrian Empire, paying heavy tribute in exchange for what they thought would give them safety. All of this is why, if you read the rest of Isaiah 6, you will see the message God gives to Isaiah, the message God wants to send, is a message of judgment. God actually says the people won't listen to Isaiah's warnings. And frankly, God says, I don't want the people to listen to me at this point. I don't want them to repent. Instead, God wants the current train of events to continue so that the people will experience the consequences of their sins. Because sometimes it is only by experiencing the consequences of your sin that you can realize what is needed. You can turn from that path and choose to do and be something different. As one scholar says, God sometimes lets people suffer the consequences of their self-delusion to learn how self-deluded they've become. So Isaiah moves from being a part of the royal court after his call narrative to become a prophetic critic of the monarch. Isaiah urges the various kings of Judah not to overreact, 
based on their fears, telling them that if they do, they will set into motion a chain of events where where they thought would save them, a military alliance with Assyria, would actually become their destruction. Because Assyria would destroy Israel. Judah would become the unhappy subject of Assyria until Hezekiah becomes king, tries to get freedom for the people again, only to have the might of the Assyrian Empire come crashing down on them again. And then after Assyria is defeated by Babylon, that empire will invade Judah, will utterly destroy the capital of Jerusalem. Because, you see, military might and political alliances are fickle friends. So what is really at the heart of Isaiah's call is this experience of the awesome power of God, a vision that communicates clearly to Isaiah that true power does not lie in the throne room of the king and the alliances the king will make, but the true power lies on the throne of God in the temple. And it is only in worship and service to that God that true and just freedom will ever be found for God's people. And you and I, on this great feast of Trinity Sunday, with the smoke of incense hanging in our own church, we could, in our worship today, have an experience of the presence of God. I wonder if we would feel similarly convicted like Isaiah. Because for a long time in our country, Christianity has played the same game that the kings of Judah played finding ways to make alliances, to build political power, afraid of losing our place in society, sure that if we can get enough power in government that we can finally protect the church, we can make things the way we know they need to be. And sure, part of that has been the role that Christian nationalism has played, especially in the past couple of decades, particularly the past four or five years. Indeed, the idolatry, absolutely, the idolatry of putting your trust in political power instead of God is one of the great heresies of Christian nationalism. But I would urge all of us, like Isaiah, to be willing to experience God and to ask how we need to be convicted, not how those people need to be convicted. Because this is not just a conservative thing. And liberals have their own narrative of of wanting political power to shape the country their way. The temptation of political power is an equal opportunity employer. (laughs) This is why we see liberals talk about immigration during elections, but when they have power doing nothing to help immigrants, to fix a broken system, a system that's been broken for decades, or they talk about health care, but then cut bargains that ensure it remains inaccessible and out of reach. It wasn't until queer people demanded equal rights for decades that liberals stopped playing politics and joined the Pride Party really late to the game, though. The commission that God gives to Isaiah, that God gives to you and me on this Trinity Sunday, is to be a spokesperson for God's vision for the world. And just like God did with Isaiah, God calls us to flee from politically expedient bargains that can be made at the cost of the vulnerable in suffering. On Trinity Sunday, we are reminded that God does not exist in isolation, but as a communion of three persons whose self-giving and interpenetrating love for each other is so profound that that we confess that they exist as a singular being. This constant flow of self-giving love for one another should have marked the people of Israel had they followed the law and its commands to care for the orphan, alien, and stranger. But it didn't. This constant flow of self-giving love should mark us as Trinitarian Christians. We should be those whose very existence is made manifest by the way in which we give up for one another 
not seeking power nor clinging to it, but giving it up for the other. Like Isaiah, God will purify our sins. God deeply desires to send us out as witnesses. But we must first, like Isaiah, repent and be made clean. Amen.